Welcome everyone. Welcome to my talk for the University of Nottingham Summer School. Uh, I would have been very happy to meet you all in person. However, because of the current situation, uh, we meet now virtually, which is also exciting because we now we can experience a lot of modern technology. And so let's make the best out of it and let's have some fun doing some beautiful mathematics. So my name is Johannes Hofscheuer, and today I'd like to discuss with you how to count. So who am I? I'm Johannes Hofscheuer. I started last October um, here in Nottingham as a Nottingham Research Fellow in Mathematics, and uh, I will teach the third year module on rings and modules in the coming term. So if you wonder why I look down from, from time to time, that's because here I have my tablet where I control this presentation. So this is the plan for today. That's what I'd like to discuss with you. So I'd like to discuss counting questions with you and show you that counting is not just counting, like one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, but counting question can be very challenging, very fascinating and give rise to some very beautiful mathematics. And uh, one of it would be the pigeon hole principle, which I then would like to discuss with you, some very elementary and crucial principle. And then I would like to give you some outlook. Um, so if mathematicians start to use these principles and push these principles, combine principles, use long arguments of um, logical arguments and combining several principles, how they can come up with some beautiful and unexpected results like the erdős sikeres theorem. So Erdős and Sikeres, two Hungarian mathematicians. So I included their pictures here. Um, and then I would like to discuss with you why is this useful and where is it used in practice? So let's start with counting questions. So what's a counting question? So certainly a counting question could be a counter for a video. So for instance, this video might have a counter and every time someone clicks play, the counter increases by one. And at the end of the day, I can look up how many people watch this video. That's certainly an easy counting question and uh, maybe not so interesting, but let me show you some very challenging and interesting counting question like this one. Let's say you have a bookshelf on and on this bookshelf, only three books fit on. However, you have five books. And now you ask yourself, in how many ways can I put three books out of my five books on this bookshelf if I also distinguish the order how these books sit on my bookshelf? So I encourage you to guess what you think this number is, and then let's try to solve it. So here's our bookshelf again. And as I said, we want to put three books out of these five on the bookshelf. So let's say this one, this one, and this one. And then we ask ourselves, in how many ways can we do this, do this uh, if also the order matters? And one way to solve this question would be, li we list all the possible combinations and then we count how many we found. That's a good idea, so let's try this. Um, so one, to s list the combinations, we need to find a way to write down the combinations. And so one way to do this, you could label the books. Uh, I could use numbers, but here I decided to use letters. So let's use capital letters, A, B, C, D, and E. And so if I, so let me show you what, how I would write down a combination. So let's say I would put book A first, then B say, and then let's say D. Then I would write this down as A, B, D. And so what I mean with the order matters, so of course, let's say A, we still put first, but then second would be D and then B. And then we would write this down as A, D. B, and the order matters means that we want to consider these two combinations as distinct combinations. And now I encourage you 
to try and list all the combinations you can find, uh, all possible combinations, um, but you will soon notice that you need a way to ensure that you really found all possible combinations. So here are two tricks. Um, one trick would be that you start listing all the combinations starting with A, then with B, then with C, and so on. And the second trick would be, why not list your combinations alphabetically? With these two tricks, you should be able systematically to list all your combinations. So here I did that. So I listed first the combination starting with A, then with B, then with C, D, and E. So here you see the combinations, the 12 combinations starting with A, then with B, C, D, and E. And then we count the numbers, then we count how many we, ha we have found of combinations, and then we get 60 combinations. So there are 60 combinations to put three books uh, out of five books on a bookshelf. We could be a bit more clever and say, well, it doesn't really matter which book I put first. I should always get the same number of combinations. So it doesn't really matter for the number of combinations, whether I put book A first or I put book B first. So here I found 12 combinations. Combination starting in A um, is 12, and that should be the same for B, C, D, and E. So we have five times 12, again, 60 combinations. And that's already quite big. So uh, I guess I wouldn't have expected that if I did that the first time. Uh, so we have 60 combinations to put three books out of five on a bookshelf. However, five books is not many. I mean, five books is something people read in a year. So what if increase these numbers slightly? So let's say we have 10 books and we want to put five on the bookshelf. So what's your guess? What do you think? And how, how many combinations are there? Certainly you could think, well, let's try to solve it again, listing all possible combinations. But well, if I look at this, I guess it's not practical to list them by hand. However, maybe I can use still this trick and list all the combinations starting uh, with A. But let me tell you that if you would try this, you would soon notice that you need a lot of pages to do this. So even the number of combinations uh, starting with A in this case is really big. So this is also not practical. So what now? How can we solve this? So you could say, well, we have powerful computers nowadays. Why don't we ask a computer to determine these combinations and then count them? And that's a good idea, so let's do this. So here I wrote some Python code to determine the combinations uh, to put K books out of a total of N books on a bookshelf. And here you see something what we mathematicians do uh, all the time, we usually do. We don't work with proper numbers, but instead we work with variables. So think of K and N as placeholders where you can plug in the numbers you want. Um, so if we go back to our baby example, then it would read as follows. Determine the number of combinations to put K equals three books out of a total of N equals five books on a bookshelf. So mathematicians do this because then they only have to do it once. And then for all the examples, we can just need to plug in the right numbers, but we don't have to do it all the time again. Now it turns out that the algorithm I just explained to you that you split um, these combinations into the ones starting with A and B and so on, um, might not be that practical to explain to a computer. So for computer, it turns out that the following algorithm might be more practic practical. So you could say, you could also get all possible combinations by picking K books and ignore the order. So disregard the order. We are not interested in the order. Just pick K books and then determine all the orderings of these chosen K books. And then continue by picking another K books and order them again and so on and so forth. And certainly, if you do this at the end, you also get all the possible uh, combinations. So let me illustrate this in our baby example again. So again, n equals five. We have a total of five books and k is three. We have 
three spaces on our bookshelf and we label the books from A to E. And now we pick three books, let's say A, B, C, and here it doesn't matter whether, like, the order doesn't matter, it just matters that we put, picked A, B, and C. And now determine all possible orderings of these three books. So we have now A first, then B second, C third, then A, C, B, B, A, C, and so on. So we have all these six um, orderings. And then you continue picking another collection of three books and so on and so forth. And certainly you would get also all possible combinations. So here's the Python code. And let's make a sanity check first so that our manual, the result we got manually is still correct and the computer gets the same. So N, the total number of books is five and K is three. And here's the code and I'm not going to explain this code in detail. So if you want to inspect this code, I suggest to make a pause here and carefully go through it. However, I want to draw your attention to these two four words you can see here. So the first four word goes through all ways how you can choose K books out of N books disregarding the order. And the second four word go through all the possible orderings of these K books. And then we add these combinations into a list and at the end we compute the length of the list and print the entries of the list and whew, thank god we got the right number 60 like we did before and hopefully the same uh, number the same combinations all right so let's continue with the second problem 10 and 5 and as I said, the beauty of variables is that we don't have to write the program. We don't have to do the mathematics again. We can just use the same arguments, but plugging in new numbers. And now look at this number. Oh my God, that's 30,240. Would you have guessed that the number is so big already that it explodes that much? I mean, look at this. I mean, even the, the combination starting in A it doesn't end here. It goes on and on and on. I mean, that's, we would have, to use a lot of pages to just list the combination starting in A. So um, thank God we didn't try that manually. Um, however, 10 and five is still not big. So, I mean, let's say, let's use some more realistic, like, realistic numbers like 20 and 10. And let me tell you, if you would like to run this code on a total of 20 books and we want to put out of these total 20 books, 10 books on our bookshelf, this program on my computer will run longer than this presentation. So this is already um, at the boundary what my computer can do. So the way we, we can solve this is using mathematics. So we really need to use mathematics to solve this question. And so what I would like to do with you now is I would like to show you how a mathematician would solve it but of course I cannot give you many details. I want to just give you an idea how we would approach it. So what's the math behind this? And it turns out that a mathematician would split this problem in exactly these two, in the same two sub questions as we did for the computer. So we would also split it into how many ways are there to choose K books out of N books, disregarding the order. And then if you have K books, how many ways are there to order these books? And a mathematician, well, of course, I mean, the number of ways how to choose K books out of N books disregarding the order, that's certainly a well-defined number. We don't know what that number is, but let's introduce some notation for it. Give it a name. Let's call it the binomial coefficient. And we write it in brackets and then N on top of K and we say N choose K. So n choose k, the binomial coefficient, n choose k, is the number of ways you can choose k books out of n books disregarding the order. And then we do the same for the uh, ways how we can order k books. Uh, so we call it k factorial and we write it as k exclamation mark. And this is the number of ways you can order k books. And k factorial is actually not so hard to compute because if you think of it, so let's say you have here your bookshelf with your K places. So for the first place, you can choose any of the K books and place it there. So for the second one, 
you can choose any of the k books except the one we already chose. So you have k minus one choices. And then for the third one, you can choose any book except the one you already have chosen. So you have k minus two books and so on and so on and so on. So k factorial can be computed as k times k minus one times k times k minus two and so on. And then for every choice of k books, disregarding the order, we have k factorial ways to order them. So the total number of combinations is k factorial times n choose k. So a mathematician would say, how many ways are there to put k books out of n books on a bookshelf where the order matters? The number is k factorial times n choose k. Of course, now you would say, well, that's not really satisfactory because I, even if I plug in numbers, I don't know what the number is, right? I mean, how does this help me? Of course, a mathematician now would continue and find efficient ways to compute these numbers, um, but that's beyond what we can do in this talk. Um, however, in Python, these efficient algorithm to compute these numbers is implemented. So let's do another sanity check. Um, whether our baby example is right and what we just discussed is right. So here I use now this mathematical approach that the number of ways is factorial k times binome n comma k. And again, we get 60. So mathematics is right, what he did manually is right, and our computer program is correct. However, let's see what number we get if you plug in for total 20 and for the number of books we can put on the bookshelf, 10. So again, I encourage you to make now a guess. And now look at this number. Oh my God, that's so big. That's 670,442,572,800 possibilities. Pooh. So this is, even if I would run it on my computer and ask it to determine all possible combinations, it would run for a long, long time. So that's at the boundary what my computer and computers nowadays can do. So I would like you to take three. So there are three things I would like you to take away here. Um, first, counting questions can be challenging and uh, they are everywhere. So even just putting books on a bookshelf is a counting question. Um, secondly, to solve these counting questions, uh, we introduce beautiful mathematics like the binomial coefficient and the factorial, some very fundamental important concepts in mathematics. And thirdly, um, so all these counting questions, if you plug in very small um, parameters like five and three, you usually should be able to do it by hand. However, if you slightly increase these numbers like 10 and five, you already need something like a computer to solve this question. However, if you want to plug in some interesting numbers like 20 and 10, I mean, it's still very small, but um, more realistic and interesting numbers, even nowadays computers cannot solve this. The, the answer explodes. So we really have to introduce this beautiful mathematics to solve these questions. All right. So let's have a look at another few interesting counting questions. So we have a 50 um, uh, pence coin, uh, 20, 10, 5, 2, and 1 penny. And the question is, how many ways are there to make change for one pound? So what do you think? What, how many ways are there? Would you have guessed that there are 4,562 ways to make change for one pound. And then the follow up question, what if I'm not allowed to use pennies? Now, what would be your guess? Um, of course, you might guess the number is smaller, but how much smaller? Would you have guessed that the answer is 196? So it drops quite a lot. Um, to solve this question, you have to introduce some very advanced mathematics, um, very beautiful answer, um, however, again, beyond the scope of this talk. Here, another counting question. Say you have an election, and in this election, two candidates are running, call them A and B, and you have two N voters. Again, N is a variable, so you plug in um, what you need. So for instance, 
n equals five, you have two times five, 10 voters, or more realistically, say n 1500, uh, 15,000. Um, so then you would have something like 30,000 uh, voters, um, and they vote sequentially. So what I mean with this is you give these two n candidates numbers from one to, to n, and then the first voter goes in, um, gives their vote, then we record the outcome, the second voter goes in, votes, we record the outcome, the third, and so on. They vote in sequence, and every time you record uh, the outcome. And at the end, um, each candidate gets n votes, and now the question is, what's the probability that candidate A never trials candidate B? So at first glance, it doesn't really look like a counting question, right? So let me convince you that it is a counting question. So how can you compute this probability? So here's a way you could do it. So count the number of ways of sequential elections such that at the end, both candidates get N votes, and then count the number of, of sequential elections where A never trails B, and then take their quotient. So take the quotient of on the top, the number of ways that you have these sequential elections such that at the end both uh, candidates get N votes and A never trails B divided by all possible sequential elections such that A and B get at the end N votes. And then you get the number between zero and one and that's the probability. Again, a beautiful question, having a beautiful answer, but again, beyond the scope. You need to introduce some very nice and beautiful mathematics. So instead, let me talk about a very elementary and important um, principle, counting principle, the pigeonhole principle. Here's the pigeonhole principle. So for the pigeonhole principle, you need two numbers, n and k. And again, these are variables, plug in numbers. So for instance, n could be five, k could be three. Um, the only thing we, we need to be careful is that n has to be bigger than k. So if you look at this picture here, you see 10 pigeons, so n would be 10, and you see nine pigeonholes, so k would be nine. And again, 10 is bigger than nine, that's fine. That's still good for the pigeonhole principle. And now the pigeonhole principle says that if you distribute these n objects to the k containers, at the end, there has to be a container containing more than one object. So in other words, in, the, in this example, you, if you distribute these 10 pigeons to the nine pigeonholes, there has to be one pigeonhole containing more than one pigeon. And this is a so-called so existence statement in mathematics because it just says there has to be one pigeonhole containing more than one pigeon, but doesn't tell you which one it is, how many pigeons are actually in there? Maybe there is another pigeon hole with, with more than one pigeon. Um, however, we know there has to be one pigeon hole where there are at least two pigeons sitting in. Um, and this is a very elementary and, and, and crucial principle. And usually the more elementary and crucial it is, the more useful it is and the further you can push it. Let me show you one fun, fun application to it. So would you have guessed that you can use the pigeonhole principle to show that there have to live two people in Nottingham having the same number of hairs on their head? So let's see how we can use the pigeonhole principle to solve this. So if you look it up in, uh, on Wikipedia, it says that on average, a person has 150,000 hairs on their head. And you can also look it up that there are more than 300,000 people living in Nottingham. So, but hold on, where are the containers? Where are the objects? I don't see any containers. Do you see any containers? All right, so here we need, have to use now a creativity. Um, so let's say in Nottingham, we set up 
150,000 and one tenths. So we set up 150,000 and one tenths. And we label these tens with the number zero, one, two, up to 150,000. So because we count from zero, we have 150,000 and one tenths. And we have the population of Nottingham, the inhabitants of Nottingham. And now you see containers. So the containers, of course, will be the tens and the objects will the population of Nottingham. So now what we do is we count the hairs of every person in Nottingham, um, we count the hairs of their heads, and then we distribute them to the correct ten. So let's say this one is bald, so they have to go here. Maybe this one hair on the head, maybe they are very hairy. Um, so this is how we distribute the objects, the the population, the inhabitants of, of Nottingham to the containers, the tens. And so here we have K, um, the number of containers, 150,001, and N, the number of objects, the people living in, in Nottingham, more than 300,000. And certainly something bigger than 300,000 is certainly bigger than 150,000 and one. So the pigeonhole principle says there has to be one container containing more than one object. So in one of these tents, the containers have to sit more than one person. However, the way we have set it up means that these two persons have the same number of hairs on their head. So in Nottingham, they have to live two people having the same number of hairs on their head. And again, it's an existence statement. We don't know which tent it is. We don't know how many people sit in this tent. We don't know whether there is another tent with more than one people sitting in. Um, however, we know there has to be one tent where more than one people are sitting in. So there have to be two people having the same number of hairs on their head. A very beautiful result, and I think a fun application of this principle. So let me give you my favorite uh, pigeonhole question and um, try, I encourage you to try it on your own. I have attached a solution um, and so you can look up the solution in the attached document. So you have a regular hexagon where all the sides of the hexagons have length one and you draw randomly some points in this hexagon. And now I claim you can use the pigeonhole principle to show that there are two points such that the distance is less than or equal than one. I really encourage you to try this and uh, yeah, look up the solution in the attachment. So now I want to show you um, what you can get if you push and push and push this principle and uh, Another thing I want to show you with this is give you an idea how statements, how mathematics would look like if you progress in your studies, let's say for one year or one and a half years. So I acknowledge that this is maybe a bit difficult at the moment. Uh, I will try to walk you through this. Um, so please bear with me, but I want to give you an idea how things would look like if you progress in, in your studies. So let's talk about the Erdős Sikeres theorem. So Erdős and Sikeres, two Hungarian mathematicians. Erdős is considered as one of the most influential um, mathematicians of the last century. Um, he didn't possess much. All his belongings fit into a suitcase and he was traveling among his collaborators. So he could just turn up at the doorstep of a collaborator and say, well, here I am, let's write a few papers. He would stay there for a few days and then uh, move on to another collaborator and write a few papers with, with them. So he has an insane number of collaborators. All right, so Erdős Sikeres theorem. So say we have n squared plus one numbers. So again, n is variable. So let's say n would be three, then we have three squared plus one, 10 uh, numbers. And uh, 
The numbers are also variables. We don't know what these numbers are. They are given again as variables. So A1, A2, up to AN squared plus one. So let me give you an idea what I mean with this. So let me help you explain this uh, with a group of people. So you have a group of people and let's use this example that N is three. So three squared plus one is 10. So we have 10 people. And we ask these people to line up in a queue. And then we measure their heights. So the first person has a height of a meter and 70, the last one of a meter and 85. And these are our, our numbers, A1, A2, and so on. And they come in an order. So A1 comes before A2, and so on. And now comes something. So before I explain you the statement, let's first try to digest what's written there. So here it says one can pick n plus one numbers. And then what? Um, so we pick numbers. And now we have to pick these numbers from the variables before. So we have, but we don't know what these numbers are. So we have to use A and then we don't know which number we pick. So for the index, we now introduce again a variable. So I1 is a variable, I2 is a variable, IN plus one is a variable, where you have to plug in the appropriate numbers if you apply it to an example. And without changing the given order means that A1 has to be less than A2, I, sorry, I1 has to be less than I2, has to be less than I3, and so on. So this means that I, A, I1 has to come first in the sequence before A, I2, and so on. And now the statement says that we can pick n plus one numbers, keeping the order as they came in A1, A2, up to AN squared, uh, A, N squared plus one, such that the picked numbers are either weakly increasing, meaning that AI1 is less than or equal, AI2 is less than or equal, AI3, and so on, or they are weakly decreasing, meaning that AI1 is greater or equal than AI2 is greater or equal than AI3. So we call this weakly increasing or weakly decreasing because we also allow equality. So again, in this example, what does this mean? So it says, so here we picked n equal three. So now it says we should be able to pick three plus one, four numbers, so four heights in the given order such that the heights are either weakly increasing or weakly decreasing. This means I could start walking down the queue and tap on some people's shoulder, then ask them to step aside and then the heights should be decreasing or in weakly decreasing or weakly increasing. So in one way it would be this one. So I could tap on the second person shoulder, the third, the eighth, and the ninth, and ask them to step aside. And then you see their heights would be decreasing in this case. And again, it doesn't tell me how I find it. So I found it using trial and error, um, but I know there has to be one. And fi finding the solution is a completely different question where we have to develop other tools. So is this useful? Um, and here are a few applications of these methods. So these combinatorial tools. So it, the whole subject is called combinatorics because it's the study of combinations um, is very useful. So one would be computer science. So let's say you wrote some code and now you ask yourself, what's the performance? What's the worst case performance of my algorithm? So how many combinations in the worst case has my code go through? What's the complexity of my code? Um, another one, we already saw probability theory. So many times you can compute uh, the probability by counting um, all, the, all the situations you are interested in divided by all possible situations. Then you get a number between zero and one and that's the probability. Another application is mobile phone communications. So if I send a text message to a friend, then I write it and then my signal gets transmitted through a wall, through maybe rain, through some air, to an antenna and the same comes back to my friend. So it has to get, get, go through again some, some air, maybe a rain, then some walls until it reaches my friend's cell phone. 
And still, I mean, if you think about this, how on earth does this signal, I mean, it has to overcome so many obstacles. How still does my message get transmitted correctly? And the answer is error correcting code. So there are mathematically one can um, develop certain ways that you can still that you can lose data and still be able to reconstruct the missing data if you don't lose too much data. Then in websites, so on websites, let's say you have a forum where you post a question, a math question, for instance, how do you how do I solve exercise whatever? And then someone posts a comment to it and then maybe someone posts an answer, maybe it's not good. So again, a, a comment and maybe a sub question and again, to this question and answer. So you get something like a tree here. Um, and then you want to load questions up so they should move. And maybe you want to then enter a sub question and a sub answer somewhere. How do you get there very quickly? And how do you count how many entries you have in this tree? So again, uh, a beautiful combinatorial question. Uh, combinatorial tools are also used a lot in computer graphics. So just recently, the Unreal 5 engine got released. Now you can use an insane number of uh, polygons to, to model beautiful landscapes and uh, beautiful shapes. And again, this is only possible with using like some very deep and beautiful combinatorial tools and many more. This is just a very short and brief uh, list. All right, so let's wrap up. So I hope I could convince you that counting questions are fascinating and can be challenging and yield some beautiful mathematics um, and some beautiful insights. And they are useful. They are useful in many disciplines. So it's a very useful tool to have in your toolbox um, nowadays. And if you think that this is something you're interested in, why not have a look at our webpage at www.nottingham.ac.uk slash mathematics for further details. Look up who we are, what we do, and uh, here a tip for your application. So if you apply, I know you have to go through a lot of bureaucracy, but please keep calm um, as long as you have the right grades and you do your application good and acceptable, you are in. So please don't get stressed out because of your personal statement, the grades are more important. And that's it, that's it, that's from my side. So if you have any more questions, please email us at summer-school at nottingham.ac.uk. And yeah, hopefully see you soon in Nottingham.